The following episode of Trinity Talk Live was filmed on the afternoon of Sunday, October 1st. After we finished filming the episode, news broke about the tragic shooting outside the Mandalay Bay Casino in Las Vegas. We here at Trinity Talk Live would just like to say that our prayers are with everyone that's been affected by this tragedy. Hi, welcome to Trinity Talk Live, water cooler conversation from a Christian perspective. I am Ken Coughlin. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'd like to start out today's episode uh, addressing all of those who watched last week's episode when I was unsure exactly what the topic of the week was going to be this week, and I'd like to say I was right. We are here to discuss small groups. Also, again, another quick reminder, if you do like this video or other videos we have on the channel, go ahead and click the thumbs up button here on the YouTube channel, the like button, because that helps us get viewed by more people who would really appreciate it. Talk about that more at the end. In the meantime, let me introduce who we've got as our panel here today. Uh, seated to my right is Lisa Henkel. Uh, Lisa is a lifelong member of Trinity, having attended Trinity Lutheran Schools, uh, completing her confirmation here at Trinity Lutheran Church, and formerly working as a teacher with Trinity Child Care. Uh, Lisa has served Trinity on the Children's and Youth Boards in a leadership role with Vacation Bible School, something we have in common and maybe can commiserate about later on, um, and as a small group leader for Confirmation One. She is a wife and mother of two teenagers, Jack, 17, and Abby, 13, and also works as the Chief Brand Officer for Celebri Learning Centers. Uh, Lisa holds a bachelor's from Excelsior College in Rochester, New York, a master's degree from Chancellor University in Cleveland, and she is a doctoral candidate with North uh, Central University. She is the small groups leader here at Trinity. So thank you very much. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. And seated to my left, making his second appearance on our show, is the man, the myth, the legend, <laughs> Bill Schaefer. Um, Bill is, uh, has been married to his wife, Carol, since 1978. Uh, together they have one daughter who has provided them with a grand dog, Dixie. Uh, Bill has been a Lutheran all his life and currently serves the congregation at Trinity here as the men's ministry leader, a Bible study leader, among other areas of service. Uh, Bill's been involved with small groups since the formation of a Tuesday night men's group about 20 years ago, and he's currently involved in two separate small groups. Is that right? Correct. Very good. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for joining us, Bill. Thank you. Um, it's always good when we have people that have been on the show before that are willing to come back. That means you must have done something right and maybe not scared you too much, right? That's correct. Okay. Bill's being nice to me today. So <laughs> why don't we go ahead and launch into our, our uh, current events segment, shall we? I got three stories for us today. Um, the first one uh, deals with Sunday, September 24th. On, on September 24th, 25-year-old Emmanuel Sampson, who was reportedly a former member of Burnett Chapel Church of Christ in Antioch, Tennessee, pulled into the church's parking lot as the Sunday services were ending and fatally shot 39-year-old church attendee Melanie Smith. He then entered the church and opened fire with two pistols, injuring six people as well as himself. Uh, Sampson pistol-whipped the usher, a uh, gentleman by the name of Robert Engel, but when Sampson accidentally shot himself, Engel went to his car, got his own firearm, and held it on Sampson until police arrived. Uh, members of Burnett Chapel have been processing this terrible tragedy and recently held their first service following the shooting. Uh, Scott Sages uh, said, uh, we confess that the words of Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken us, have been words we've spoken over the last few days. Uh, we pray, Lord, you would remind us of your presence. Um, our second story uh, is from September 27th. Students around the world gathered at their school's flagpole for the 25th, 25th annual See You at the Pole event. Uh, the event is a simple time of prayer for countries, families, teachers, and schools. Uh, the prayer rallies are led by students who gather at the flagpoles for a time of prayer before the school day begins. See You at the Pole began in 1999 and began with a group of students in Texas simply meeting to pray. Uh, but the prayer rallies caught on and are growing strong today with an estimated one million students participating this year. Uh, this year had a theme called Fix Your Eyes, which was taken from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, which encourages Christians in fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And our third story comes from the Houston Texans. Rookie quarterback of the Houston Texans, Deshaun Watson, a graduate of Clemson and a Christian, uh, did something very selfless with his first NFL paycheck. He gave the money to the women who work at the team's cafeteria. Uh, Watson's first paycheck was worth over $27,000. 
He wanted to give it to the women who work in the team's cafeteria to show his appreciation for all that they do, and also to help him financially because they had been affected by Hurricane Harvey. Mm -hmm. Uh, when he was younger, uh, Watson and his family had lived in a house that was built via Habitat for Humanity. Uh, Watson told the three women, uh, for what you all do for us every day and never complain, I really appreciate you all. So I wanted to give my first game check to you all to help you all out in some type of way. Uh, so those are our three current event stories. Uh, let me turn things over to Bill here and ask you what, if anything, stood out to you in those stories. Well, when I read the three, um, you know, I, I had my eyes fixed on that first one, uh, you know, about the, the church shooting. And I believe, is this, isn't this the one where it was more of a revenge thing for a two-year-old thing to happen down in I Charleston? I think so. Yeah, I think, I think that's what they said in the news. But, but then as I read the other stories, um, one of the things that really caught my eye was this uh, young man out of uh, the Houston, Texas. Um, with all the negative publicity that's going on right now with the football leagues, um, you know, across the country, um, I thought this was one positive story that really needs to get out there because that's what, you know, God intends for us to do is help other people. And that's exactly what he did. He wasn't selfish. He was selfless. That's kind of why I picked these stories. That, mm -hmm. that bugs me about the media today. It really gets yeah. under my skin is... How come, and I, I'd say I, but really my wife found these stories, I gotta give her all the credit, but she goes out and has to dig up a story like this, and yet mm -hmm. you turn on the, most of the media, you're not hearing this story about the NFL, you're hearing the other stories about Correct. the NFL. Yeah. Why can't we report the positive stuff more? I, I haven't figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I guess the, the, the idea is that they don't think people wanna hear it. I can't speak for everybody in this country, but I wanna hear it. I like hearing the positive stories. So, Lisa, what stood out to you in those? It was funny because the exact opposite for me, the center story about Rally Around the Flagpole really mm -hmm. stood out for me. And I think um, one of the things about that story is for me, um, as a young adult when it started and now as a parent, the way that that event has grown mm -hmm. is amazing. Mm -hmm. So it started out with a small group of students at the flagpole. They felt like they needed a place where they could pray in the morning. And now it's not just students. It's students and teachers and principals and parents who go on this one special day to say, I'm here and I'm Christian and I'm praying. You know, it reminds me of um, actually what we're going to be talking about is you know, a little bit the early church. Um, it kind of seems to mirror that. God works that way, doesn't he? You look at the early church. Yeah. It was a small gatherings, meeting in homes, and then God takes that and over the last 2,000 years, look what it's become now. You know, yeah. God can take a little seed and mm -hmm. uh, that we may not think is going to grow in anything. We, I'm sure these, these kids just thought, okay, we're just going to get around and go pray around our flagpole. And right. next thing you know, uh, what, eight, it started in 1999, I think I said. 99. So, yeah, here we are 18 years later, and you've mm -hmm. got a million students around the world participating in it. And, and what bravery it takes for these students to say, I'm going to put myself aside mm -hmm. and I'm going to be here at this flagpole and I'm going to pray with yeah. others. Yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah. yeah and, and you know, one, one thing that really caught my attention out of that story as well was the fact that um, the young people started out as a small group, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and then it grew into this humongous group of a, you know, a million kids and families um, even getting involved. The unfortunate thing is, they only do it once a year. Yeah, uh, and that's what kind of stuck out. And I remember when I was a kid growing up and going to school, we didn't have to worry about praying around a flag pole. We prayed every day in our room, mm -hmm. and we started the the day off with the Lord's Prayer. And I think if they brought that back to school today, then maybe you know we wouldn't have all the things going on in school that we do. Mm -hmm. well, well, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I think yeah. the event, it, it has become an event on one yeah. day. So it is a, a nationally recognized event that right. um, students come to the flagpole mm -hmm. on that day. Parents make time in their schedule to stay that morning. But there are groups along with mm. this effort who meet every Tuesday morning at the flagpole. It's just their central point of meeting and mm -hmm. they are very much um, become like a small group because then they know, oh, I right. recognize that person from the flagpole. That's uh -huh. my fellow uh -huh. Christian here in school. It's just that that particular day has become mm -hmm. well-renowned mm -hmm. um, because that gives everybody sort of 
an excuse to yeah. be at the flagpole. Yeah, the flag it flag gives pole. them that validation of being at the flagpole, but there are others who take it further and they say, we meet at this flagpole. I know mm -hmm. um, at our local high school, they meet every Tuesday morning at the flagpole. Really? Good. Yeah. Well, I, again, I've said this a number of times on the show that I'm also a lawyer. Um, and I think I mentioned this once when we were uh, back in the, had the high school episode a couple months or about a month and a half ago back in August um, that you know students that are out there that are watching understand that that's your constitutional right. I mean they can't the school can't tell you that you on your own can't pray. I mean it, the, the essence of this meet you at the poll is mm -hmm. that it's student led. Um, as long as things are student led. Mm -hmm. um, Generally speaking, I'm not going to get a big, long legal dissertation now, but because there's a few exceptions, graduation ceremonies come to mind. Um, but generally speaking, when you've got these student-led groups, you know that's perfectly constitutional. Public school, private school, whatever. So um, don't feel intimidated. By, it's not to say that people won't tell you that you can't do it, because a lot of people are wrong about the law. We have examples like that all the time. But you, as a student, do have the right to, to do self-led prayer and that free exercise of religion. So. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Why don't we launch into our topic of the week, shall we? Uh, today, what we're going to be talking about is the benefit and purpose of small groups. Um, and I want to start out today with a scripture, and then I'm going to turn things over to our illustrious small group leader over here, Lisa, to bestow upon us her wisdom. Um, but the, the particular passage is from Acts chapter 2, and it goes on longer, but I'm, I'm quoting two verses here, uh, 46 and 47. And it says, every day, this is talking about the early church now. This is, like I said, second chapter of Acts, so, you know, the earliest, about the earliest of the early church post Jesus um, ascension that we can get. And uh, it says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So we, we have an example here of how the earliest church was meeting together. And I guess what I want to ask you, Lisa, to start out with is what can we as modern Christians learn today about how, or what can we learn from the early church in the way that they were meeting? Mm -hmm. I, I, I looked at some uh, history of the small group, and I think one of the things that really stuck out to me was, you know, when we look at what Jesus himself did, he pulled a group of disciples. We would look at that today and say, that's a small group. Did Jesus really need a small group? <laughs> Probably not. But I think that the, there was a lot of intentionality there to model for us and to show us what congregation was supposed to look like. Um, and I think that when you mentioned the early church and you mentioned that they broke bread together and that they met together, the big difference between what they did then and what we do now was small groups were the church the whole entire church. That's how they met all the time. Whereas now we view small groups as part of a larger congregation or a ministry within a church. Whereas they had nothing else. They only had small groups and everything grew from that. Mm -hmm. Well, Bill, let me ask you this, because you're in a couple small groups here. Some people, uh, I mean, I, I know I've grown up in churches that didn't emphasize small groups. I've been to mm -hmm. uh, churches in my life that, um, that it just wasn't a priority, wasn't even talked about. Um, and I think there might be some people out there uh, that look at these small group phenomena. So I already attend, you know, uh, Pastor Paul's teaching a Bible, a Wednesday night Bible study right now, you know, an eight week Bible study or whatever like that. I sign up for Bible studies every mm -hmm. now and then. I, sure. I learned this book or that book through these studies. What distinguishes a small group from just a regular Bible study that you might see at a church? I think more, um, you know, when you talk about small groups, uh, other than the large congregation that meets in the you know, sanctuary once a week. Um, small groups work together and function together. Um, they not only meet for Bible study, um, we meet for a fellowship time. Um, like the Gospel Gourmet is the group that I'm in. Uh, and the reason why we picked that name was, one, because we study the Bible, God's Gospel. Um, but we also met to eat. And so we did. We literally, Acts 2, lived it. Um, we broke bread. We made dinner. And each person made something, you know, to go with the theme for that day. So uh, one day we would do Mexican. And, you know, some days we would just do, uh, you know, beef roast or something like that. Um, but we met together and got to know each other. Um, got in depth with each other, and we kind of look out for each other. We pray for each other. 
So it's a lot different than just, you know, you come to church and you worship with a whole bunch of people. You get to know these people. And it, that's what's important. I think if I had to go a similar theme for a small group that I was in, I'd be in. It'd have to be like a holy fast food or something like that. <laughs> that's a steak. I can cook steak. I can cook yeah. steak but You're always on the run. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not. Uh, the kitchen is not my strong suit. My wife is great. Me, not so much. So. I, I think a big point about what Bill just shared is intimacy. Mm-hmm. Not a romantic intimacy, but an intimacy with fellow Christians. And yes, it's important to come to. Sunday service and have that worship time, but you don't have an intimacy with your fellow Christians at Sunday service. And, and you don't have that when you're at your eight hour a day work or your 10 or in my case, 12 hour a day work. You have a lot of noise that's happening and, and these small groups give you that anchor and that intimacy and that grounding point of other people that you can share. Hey, this is really bothering, bothering me in the current events. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about this. How can I look at this from a biblical perspective or, mm-hmm. hey, I'm really having a, a health issue and and I'm not sure how to deal with this again right. and how to turn this over to Christ. How do I do that? And a small group really gives you that, um, that root, that rootedness mm-hmm. to share and to grow your faith with other people. Yeah. I, uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned your know, corporate worship, the, the, the big worship thing, because I do want to make sure that people understand that, uh, you know, there's small groups, have a lot of benefits and part of the reason I just sort of wanted to title this is the benefit and purpose of small groups is to understand it's like they also have a purpose and mm-hmm. that purpose is not to replace coming together as a broader right. congregation there are things that it's just a matter of what is what type of environment is best suited mm-hmm. um, for whatever the goals of that particular gathering is when it comes to a um, uh, you know, corporate worship. That's you know, you're going to have more praise time. You're going to get to hear the message from the from the pastor. And there's so there's learning there. But you're not going to be uh, leaning over to your neighbor and you know, during the middle of the sermon and start you know what did he do? Well, let me let me let, let's have a little let's explore yeah. that issue a little bit more. You know, <laughs> they each have their own purpose. You mm-hmm. know, and so there's things that you know corporate worship gets you that you're not going to get out of a small group. But there are things that corporate worship inevitably can't get you that you need a small group for. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, that's one of them things where, um, you know, when I when I look at um, the small group on Tuesday night, for instance, um, that group started as in uh, what they called back then as an accountability group. And where we, we all went down to, uh, you know, uh, RFK Stadium for a Promise Keepers event. And we come back and... You know, first thing Pastor Paul says, yeah, we got to start the small groups like those guys said. So we all broke out into little small groups that, and ours was really functioning well because um, there was a bunch of us guys who had kids in confirmation at that time. And so our Tuesday night group uh, was basically men who had confirmation kids. And we were dropping our kids off, and we said, well, hey, hey, we're at church anyway. Why go all the way back home? We'll just stay here. We'll, we'll meet while they do confirmation. And that's how we, we developed a relationship. Of course, then we added to our numbers, and then we lost a few. And then it, through the years, it kind of evolved. And now it's, it's to a point where we care for each other. Uh, the guys that meet every Tuesday, it's a bunch of old guys. Um, you don't have in a sense of age, anymore, not right? <laughs> not in heart, um, but we we have a bunch of you know guys that meet every Tuesday night, and you know we we care for each other, we pray for each other, and you know we do do a Bible study, we have snacks, you gotta have you know something, um, and basically if one of them's hurting, um, I bring a card that night, and we'll all sign the card and send it to them. So, you know, in recent times, we, you know, uh, Bill Hall, for instance, you know, broke his wrist. Um, he wasn't at the group for a couple of nights. So I brought a card. We're going to send him a card. And that's what's important. The intimacy, like Lisa mentioned earlier, um, you know, that's important even amongst men who, you know, bring themselves to a small group. You haven't sent him the card yet? 
Who? Because if he what? Oh, Phil? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Oh, he got his card. He's, oh, okay. He's so back he, he made you sound like yeah, he's, yeah, he's, he's a, I hope he's not watching the show, No, 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 no. He's, a, he's in a, one of those flexible cast, casts now that he can move his, you know, fingers and, to, you know, stuff. And No, he, he came back and, you know, was able to, you know, function. And, okay. I think Bill makes another great point. A lot of times you will see that small groups start with people in a certain season of life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they start with a, a bunch of children. We have a small group now called Kids, Kids Everywhere. And it's parents who have children who are three, four, and five. Well, that group will grow together and their challenges will be similar because they're in a similar season of life mm-hmm. and they'll have each other to lean on. Just like your group grew when mm-hmm. you all had children in confirmation, then they all went to high school and then they went to college and you had these mm-hmm. similar experiences to share and to um, use as mm-hmm subject matters for your small group we really find those are the successful small groups that grow and stay right. together because they do have that commonality so you know when when i spoke in church and i jokingly said do you like to run do you like to eat gourmet yep. food it is about common interest because those are the things that tie us together and then allow us to grow together mm-hmm. matter of fact i i wanted to, i'm glad you said that because that's a topic i wanted to make sure we covered before we finished today and we're not completely out of time, but we're starting to get on the tail end of the episode here. Um, I, In preparation for today, you know, obviously you read a lot of articles about small groups in general, but I also read some criticisms of small groups. And a lot of those articles, I, as I read them, I was like, okay, but I think you're really missing the point for a lot of them. Um, but you mentioned people having commonalities and things mm-hmm. in common. What I found is a lot of people who were criticizing small groups it's almost like they were just by default thinking that they had to be almost mechan- mechanistic. It's like, you know, well, we all just, we meet a certain time for one hour, we come, we do our Bible study, we leave, and it's like, and they, they, the articles read almost like in, it was an inevit- inevitability that small groups turn into nothing more than, you know, detail, scheduled every down to the minute, boom, boom, we do this, we do this, we do this, we're gone, see ya. And that is saying, well, you don't make connections that way. You don't make personal mm-hmm. connections that way. And I know my reaction, I'd be interested in get your response to this, was it's like small groups don't have to be that way, though. I mean, like for our small group that we just joined, we decided to meet once before, because the church is sponsoring, uh, has a Bible study that it's, we're working our way through right now with our small groups, so I'll let you talk about in a second. But we decided, you know what, before we even start the Bible study, let's all just get together mm-hmm. so we can just chat and get to know each other. So, know each other. I'd be interested to hear what your response would be to that criticism that people think that small groups by default are almost just, they're all just cookie cutter types of things. You can't make a personal connection in them. I think that what happened was small groups became very trendy. And this is where the cookie cutterness came from because you had a very large mega church out on the West Coast who was kind of selling the formula for small groups. And this is how small groups look. And if you do this, this is what will happen within your church. And I think that what we've found here at Trinity is it has to be very connected and it has to be very much about the people. Um, one of the things that I did this year is, look, I'm a mom. I work full time. I go to school. I have a part time ministry job. I have two children. They play sports. I'm really busy. And finding time for a small group is something I have to literally find time for. So I thought, you know, we really have to look at how do small groups evolve and connect with people. So we're doing a virtual small group. And we did very similar to what you did. We started two weeks ago, Mm -hmm. way before the reading started with introductions and getting to know each other. And then when I run into those people at the regular services on Sunday, we have all these connections already. Mm -hmm. And that's where the foundation of the small group comes from. So this small group that we started virtually this time may end up being a physical small group with the next study or or through the summer or however we can get together. But I think it's really important to make sure that those small groups do become about connections and not about the number of small groups that you have and not about it being uh, just another thing to check off that your church has done. Well, because I, I was also a, uh, I was a criminal justice major in undergrad um, more years ago than we're going to talk about publicly on camera. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things, criminal justice, a lot of people that don't know, it's, it's, it's largely a sociological thing. It's not necessarily, there's some law aspects of it, but it's mostly sociology, and it, but from a criminal perspective. And it talks about, um, you know, the causes of crime and what kinds of approaches might actually help reduce crime rates and things like that on a broad societal level. 
And you know, one of the things that we talked about an awful lot was a far more effective way to affect people's behavior is um, more so than just telling them, well, if you do X, we're gonna punish you with Y. It's more a matter of approval or disapproval of the people, of their, the people that they value, that they find to be important. And I just, it, when I was reading some of the stuff about the small groups and I started going back to that and I'm thinking, well, isn't that kind of like what Jesus tells us? It's like, okay, we're here. If you're just worried about corporate worship, you're coming to corporate worship once a week, that's great. You need to do that, recharge your batteries, but then you go out into the world and you're gonna be getting bombarded with a bunch of other messages. If we want to stay true to Christ, I find making personal connections in small groups with forcing yourself to get into a habit of communing with other fellow believers, like-minded people who also put Christ at the forefront, is going to help you stay on the straight and narrow as well. I think it's an important function to it. Yeah, and, and we kind of try to um, live up to our, I don't know what you call it, the motto that we have here, or the, the, the our, the our mission. No, wait, that's our mission. Workout. Our mission. That's what I. That's the word I was looking for. Thanks, Lisa. Um, it, it, you know, our mission is connecting with God. Mm -hmm. connecting with each other and then connecting with others and I've seen it so many times in small groups around here how they've connected with each other and then they've also connected in the community of faith um, so they've connected here at church um, you know they brought their small group they sit together in church yet they're not afraid to reach out and touch other people mm -hmm. and then they go and on missions themselves you know some of them are going to Guatemala, some are going to Biloxi, some, you know, adult missions, some, you know, just local stuff that we do. And, you know, you see that too frequent around here with the small groups that we've developed that they actually do get involved with not only connecting with God, connecting with each other, but they get connected with others out in the world, whether it's in the community around here or whether it's a community within the world that we live in. So there's a lot more to small groups than I think a lot of people think when they just hear the term. It's not just getting together for a Bible study. It's, it's, right. it's like a miniature uh, mini congregation. Or it's a family. It's personal connections, mm -hmm. you know, and there's so much you can do with that. Um, well, I want to give uh, Lisa a, a chance here before we sign off. Since you are the small group's leader, obviously some people watching, you know, might be watching us from Timbuktu. And so in your case, if you don't have a small group ministry at your church, I think the motto here, or the, the uh, not the motto. The mission. The, not mission. even that. I just don't even know why I'm saying that. The conclusion uh, I think that we're uh, recommending is, you know, to get a small group's ministry going at your church. It's going to be very beneficial. But for those people that are in the Harford County, Baltimore County area, mm -hmm. uh, or people that are actually members here at Trinity that aren't involved in small groups, um, if uh, they want to learn more about it and they want to get involved, um, first of all, what do we have going on here for our small groups and how would people go about getting up and joining up with one? Well, we have a, a lot going on with small groups. So we have a lot of small groups that are um, differently based. So we have men's small groups, we have women's small groups, we have groups that are based around fellowship, we have groups that started out as Bible studies and then move on to something else. Um, we have groups that have been with us since we very first started uh, our small groups, the men's in mission and the crabs group have been around for more than 20 years. Um, so what we do to facilitate people joining the small group is we usually start, we'll do two church-wide studies every year. And right now we just started a church-wide study called The Good Book. And The Good Book gives us an opportunity to look at 40 chapters throughout the Bible that really help us to understand the major themes of the Bible. And the reason we use this as a kickoff for small groups is you can join a small group just to do this study. So this is an eight-week study. Try it out see if small groups work for you, see if you've found the right small group. Because again, we are expecting small groups to be relational. We want you to have relationships with those people in your small groups. So if this is not the group for you, you'll be able to move on after the study, but you will have given it a try. You'll be able to see if that is a place where you really fit in. So in this particular study, we're reading every week and then that um, week's session is being summarized by the pastors in the sermon. And then we'll have the next week's reading and go that way for the next eight weeks. Um, it is the, called The Good Book. Uh, the great piece about this particular study, it's the first time, is that it is uh, internet-based. So if you want to follow along, we have the Right Now Media subscription. 
that everybody has access to and all of the videos and all of the content around the study can be found there. So it's really easy to access for everyone. Um, and how do people, if people want to join a small group, how do they get in touch with you? Uh, they would get in touch with me either by calling the church directly and asking for me. I have a voicemail. I've only gotten one message so far, but most people like to email me. <laughs> um, I get lots of email, and that's lhenkel, H-E-N-K-E-L, at trinityjapa.org. Um, let me know what kind of group you're interested in. We've had a lot of people for this particular study who've shown interest in joining a new small group, and we've been able to get them out to different groups and, and experience Christ's word in that way. Um, so if they send me an email, tell me a little bit about their interest. We'll be happy to see which group fits with them. We also have a wide variety of schedules available. Mm -hmm. We have groups that meet every day of the week. We have groups that meet in the morning and meet in the evenings and meet on weekends. So if the scheduling is an issue, we'll make sure that we can accommodate that as well. As a matter of fact, something I want to add, um, and then we do need to sign off here, but I, I mentioned, you know, this is for you know, people that are in the Baltimore, Harford County area. If there is anybody watching who wants to join us on this journey through the good book and you're um, not in the area, uh, Trinity has so much online, like even like you mentioned, um, you know, for our congregation, we have the Right Now Media. Um, but we started uh, a week ago, so we're about a week into it, but you can certainly catch up. Um, and on our Facebook page, our Twitter p account, our uh, Instagram, Every single day, we actually do post the reading for that day, whatever the chapter is for that day, and there's a link to it. So if you go to the Trinity Joppa uh, Facebook page, um, every day there will be a um, uh, there there will be a link on there to the Bible Gateway website where you can just go ahead and click on that link, and you'll get the reading for the day. Um, you can this is the book, this is the, the participants guide for the study, which you can find on ChristianBook.com, Amazon.com, uh, the Good Book Participants Guide by Darren Spoo. You pick this up on your own. You can follow along with the, the, uh, the study in there. And the, you mentioned the sermons. Um, on, on the Trinity Joppa YouTube channel, there's a uh, playlist called The Weekly Message. And the usually by Monday or Tuesday at the latest, that weekend sermon is up there for people to watch. So you actually out there in internet land can do this study with us if you want. We have all the, the, the information you need out there so that you can follow right along with us. Now you've got a little catching up to do. You've got a week of catching up to do. That's about five, six chapters by the time this airs. Uh, but I know you all can do it. So, um, all right. Uh, well, good. Thank you very much for joining me. Both of you, Lisa Hankel, thank Bill you. Schaefer, I really appreciate it. And thank you all for tuning in. Um, again, if you did like this video, do me a favor. Go ahead and click the like button. That's the thumbs up button right here on the YouTube channel. Also, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, that'll help you. You'll keep informed of everything we have posted. And most of all, share. I'm going to say this over and over again. Share, 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 share. If you are on Facebook, if you are on Instagram, if you are on Twitter, copy the link to this video, share it to other people out there, both so they can benefit from this particular topic and so they can find about our whole show here in the series. We've got a lot of other episodes we've done already and a lot more good ones planned in the future. Um, we do have, uh, in addition to the Trinity Joppa YouTube uh, or Facebook page I mentioned before, uh, Trinity Talk Live has its own Facebook page, uh, at Trinity Talk Live Podcast. If you go to that page as well and uh, give a like to that, that's where we post updates on what we've got coming up here on Trinity Talk Live. And we also accept feedback from you. So if you have a question about an episode or if you have an idea for a future episode that you would like to see, you can post it on that Facebook page, and that's a way of communicating with us. Uh, and I want to the reason I want to part, draw particular attention to that this week is because next week's episode is actually one that was suggested by somebody out there in the internet world. Um, somebody uh, said that they uh, they wrote to us and indicated that they get a lot of. Um, <sighs> feedback from people that think Christians are a bunch of fuddy-duddies who can't have fun. So they want us to do an episode of Can Christians Have Fun? So that is our topic for next week. Can Christians Have Fun? I got a bunch of what I hope are fun-loving people coming in here to help us out with that episode. We'll see if it works out or not. Okay? So again, thank you very much. Episodes go live Tuesdays at noon. Thank you to Bill Schaefer. Thank you to Lisa Hankel. And thank you all of you. God bless. In your word we will find